were here to join the celebration surrounding the arrival of the first folio and celebrate the culmination of an extraordinary journey for the University of Mississippi's Opera Theater program. The book that gave us Shakespeare is why we have the play Hamlet and what provided the inspiration for Dr. Nancy Van de opera, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. This adventure began with a simple act of praise. Clyde Smith reached out to me in 1998 to congratulate the University Opera Program for winning first place in the National Opera Association's Opera Production Competition with our two chamber operas, Johnny Skiki and Amelia Goes to the Ball. He mentioned that his wife, Nancy Van Vade, was an alumna of the university and that she was an active composer of several genres of music, including opera. This contact resulted in a connection to the University of Opera Theater Ensemble that included the premiere of her chamber opera, The Death of the Hired Man, in 1999, and in 2006, a festival of her music included a scene from her award-winning Where the Cross is Laid. During many of our conversations at the National Opera Association conventions, Nancy mentioned that she was working on a new opera based on Hamlet. I kept up with the progress of her writing, and in 2013, I went to Vienna to discuss the possibility of producing the premiere in Oxford and then taking it abroad for a European premiere. It was my good fortune to gain the enthusiastic support of Norm Easterbrook, the former director of the Ford Center, who embraced my vision of a production that offered our students and faculty an experience they would never forget. He, in turn, secured the generous financial support of the Ford Foundation that made it possible to even consider a trip abroad for the entire Hamlet cast and crew. I was again fortunate in my colleagues and students who placed their trust in my ability to bring all the diverse elements of a new and complex opera to the stage at a level well beyond our usual productions. After two years of preparation, and the support of the Provost's Office, the Dean of College of Liberal Arts, the Departments of Music and Theater, and Cheryl Sims, the UM Opera Theater presented the world premiere of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, in the Ford Center on April 18, 2015, and then traveled to Prague to present the opera again on May 30, 2015. So what began with a simple act of praise now ends with an eloquent <coughs> act of praise. Nancy could not be here this evening, but wanted to add her voice to this celebration. G. William Bug is Professor Emeritus of Music at Sanford University, where he was the Director of Opera and Taught Voice. As a singer, Bill has had an extensive career abroad in the United States in opera, musical theater, and cabaret. In Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, Dr. Bug sang the role of the ghost and the gravedigger. He has graciously agreed to lend his sonorous bass voice to read a letter from the composer written specifically for this occasion. Bill? I'm going to go home and look up sonorous. <clears throat> <laughs> it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to take part in this presentation. And it's an honor to read the words of Nancy Van de Vader. It is a great pleasure and a great honor to share this wonderful event with you, even though I am not able to be here today in this beautiful concert hall where it all began. Sing thee to thy rest, Old Miss Opera in Czech Republic, the documentary film by award-winning producer Matthew Graves, will bring to life again a remarkable and quite unique experience in the production of a new opera. Shakespeare and Music, a lecture by Dr. Robert Griggs, will add scholarly depth to the vividness of the stage performance. The arrival tomorrow of the first folio enabling the most valuable book in the world to be presented here at the Ford Center further highlights its amazing series of Shakespeare events at Ole Miss. The production of an opera is a massive task requiring many different kinds of skills and experiences. The music which involves not only singing but conducting and performing on many different kinds of orchestral instruments is only one component acting, choreography, set design, costume design, makeup, and light, stage lighting are all essential features. 
The quality of the performing space visually and acoustically is enormously important, and no concert halls anywhere in the world could have been better for our presentations of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, than the Gertrude C. Ford Center of the Performing Arts and the Theater of Venerazzi in Prague. Every person involved in an operatic production, whether on stage or behind the scenes, is vitally important, but perhaps most essential is the producer who coordinates everything. Professor Julia Aubrey, with her extensive knowledge of both music and theater, her patience and her professional dedication, not only dared to present a new and complex modern opera to a public on two continents, she did it at the highest professional level. A remarkable achievement under any circumstances. It is even more so in that it was done with the wholehearted support of the university, using students in many key roles. The entire cast and crew were outstanding in every respect, and words alone can never adequately convey my thanks to all of you who made it possible. Innate musical talent exists everywhere, but realizing it in a performance that depends on training and experience. The excellence of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark's production, is an irrefutable testimony to the high quality of music education at the University of Mississippi. Those students who took part in the production in Prague were introduced to presenting opera in an, in an international context, an experience of inestimable value, especially to future performers, and one they may never forget. Opera is not new to Ole Miss. It was more than 60 years since I first arrived here and began to study music composition. In December of 1955, I was the pianist for the production, a production in Fulton Chapel of Jim. Giancarlo Menotti's opera Among the Night Visitors. Although no orchestra were used, it was a splendid production done by the music department under the direction of Professor Joseph Galtz. The composition professor, Arthur Preutz, had himself composed several full-length operas, but before and after this time at Ole Miss. One of them, the University Graves, tells the story of the uncommonly brave infantry unit in the Confederate Army, which consisted almost entirely of University of Mississippi students. At the Battle of Gettysburg, it sustained 100% casualties. Every soldier was either killed or wounded. In that environment, I felt comfortable working in music and theater. And in 1958, shortly after completing my master's degree in music composition, wrote and produced my first short opera, The Death of the Hired Man, based on the poem by Robert Frost. It was then performed in several Mississippi towns by university singers, one a faculty member and one a student. In 1999, it was again performed at Ole Miss under the direction of Julia Aubrey, and at the end of this year, will be performed in Vienna at the Society of Music Theater, Gesellschaft Schütter Music Theater. The documentary of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by Matthew Graves, preserves a truly notable achievement by the University of Mississippi Opera Theater. The productions and follow-on documentation are also vitally important to the general public at a time when opera is sometimes said to be out of date, even irrelevant. For the composer, everything was and remains of immeasurable value. Music is written to be performed and, above all, to be heard. Without being heard, it remains only spots on paper. Opera is composed to be heard and seen. In performing Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, in two superb stage productions, a new opera was brought to life. Sing Me to Thy Rest, the Mississippi Road production, a Hamlet homecoming, produced by John Langford, and today's wonderful event, Help Keep It Alive. Thank you for everything, and a warm welcome to all. Nancy Van Center is the only facility in Mississippi awarded the privilege of hosting the first folio. It actually arrives tomorrow and will be officially welcomed by the Chancellor on April 11th. I hope you all join us for this momentous occasion. What is extraordinary happens chance is that the folio on display is open to the page with Hamlet's soliloquy to be or not to be. To give this connection even more gravitas, we will see and hear an excerpt from the opera featuring our Hamlet, 
guest artist Ryan McPherson singing the aria based on Shakespeare's famous soliloquy. And now, Ryan McPherson. Music Society, the American Musicology Society, Music 
Musicological Society, the International Musicological Society, and the International Mozart Congress, Congress in Salzburg. He has also published articles on Mozart, aesthetics, and historical performances in leading journals. His book, Leon Kirchner, Composer, Performer, and Teacher, was published in 2010 by the University of Rochester Press in its Eastman Studies in Music series. His new book on violin literature will be published in the fall. He will now present his lecture, Shakespeare and Music. Dr. Bates. Thank you for the kind introduction, Julia. Good evening and welcome to Shakespeare and Music. <clears throat> In an off-quoted love scene from The Merchant of Venice, Lorenzo speaks eloquently with many references to music to his beloved Jessica. He concludes by declaring, the man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. <laughs> Mark the music, that is to say, pay attention to the music. Although one of his characters speaks these lines, I believe that they reflect Shakespeare's own position regarding the importance of music in his works. Evidence comes from the plays themselves. To begin with, his poetry and prose are frequently and justly praised for their metaphorical musical qualities of meter, rhyme, and sheer beauty of sound. This evening, however, I will focus first on the crucial role of actual sounding music in the original productions of his plays, and then, in order to provide context for the Hamlet documentary that follows, I will address operatic adaptations of Shakespeare. When realized on stage in Elizabethan England, music was an essential component of Shakespeare's productions. His plays were framed by music. In some theaters, there was an overture of instrumental music before the play began, and performances always concluded with a short musical postlude called a jig, which involved music and dance. It could be comic and satirical, or stately and elegant, but it was unrelated to the plot of the play and was performed by the same actors, many of whom might have just died in their roles on stage a few minutes earlier. <laughs> Thus, it was expected that drama and action, even tragic action, would ultimately conclude harmoniously with music and dance. In addition, in the course of the play itself, there were periodic musical fanfares to announce the arrival of important personages and to indicate imminent major events. Even more significantly, in all of his plays, Shakespeare alludes to or quotes the text as the lyrics of popular songs. He was immersed in the popular music of his day and his quotations and allusions draw on the large repertory of current popular ballads, love songs, and drinking songs. It may come as a surprise that Shakespeare's song texts, with rare exceptions, were not written by him, nor were they created especially for use in his plays. The texts had enjoyed wide circulation prior to and apart from the plays, because they had been printed on single sheets of paper known as broadsides, and sold individually for half penny each. A broadside contained the lyrics for a song, but no musical notation for its melody. Instead, the name of the tune to which it was to be sung is provided. Thus, there also existed a substantial body of well-known song tunes that could be matched up with a variety of texts. Shakespeare could assume, therefore, that his audiences and readers were familiar with his repertory of texts and tunes. And he capitalized on this familiarity by inserting songs at strategic places where their associations both textual and musical, would suddenly contribute to the interpretation and dramatic impact of the scene. Let's consider two examples. This excerpt is from the second act of Hamlet, where Hamlet intersperses lines from a ballad about Jephthah's judge of Israel. With 
in his conversation uh, with Polonius. In this cryptic way, his allusion reveals foreknowledge that Polonius' daughter, Ophelia, might also suffer an early death, perhaps due to her father's actions, which indeed was the fate of Jephthah's daughter. The broadside ballad that is the source for these lines relates the entire biblical story in eight stanzas. But as is sometimes the case, on this broadside, there is no indication for the tune to which it is to be sung. However, it fits beautifully to the melody of Greensleeves, a tune that had been in circulation since the 1580s, and which is heard on this recording. Orpheus and Eurydice. 
This masterpiece is the oldest opera in the modern repertoire. <coughs> During the 17th century, opera became wildly popular throughout Italy. And Italian opera was exported to France, Germany, and England, where it was warmly received. As a result, composers in these countries also began creating operas in their native languages. Most librettos in this century were based either on ancient historical events or on classical literature. In the 18th century, however, composers began showing more interest in adapting Shakespeare. But of the approximately 40 Shakespearean operas from this century, none have stood the test of time. In the 19th century, however, because of an increase in the number and quality of translations into the continental languages, and a, per and a perceived compatibility between Shakespeare's plays and romantic aesthetics, musical interest in them skyrocketed and has continued unabated to this day. <clears throat> in all, some 300 operas have been composed on Shakespearean librettos, more than any other literary figure. With the exception of several history plays, all of his other works have inspired operas. The most frequently adapted plays include The Tempest with 31 operas, Romeo and Juliet with 24, other plays with between 10 and 15 operas each include A Midsummer Night's Dream, Hamlet, Twelfth Night, Merchant of Venice, The Taming of the Shrew, and The Merry Wives of Windsor. This next slide shows the most successful Shakespearean operas in regard to their modern performance history and critical reception. As you can see, there are outstanding examples in, uh, in Italian, French, and German, all dating from the 19th century. Of this list, those by Verdi are considered today to be the most, uh, most outstanding uh, of, the, of the whole group, actually. And then finally, in the 20th century, uh, two British composers have created operas that have every indication of joining the standard uh, repertory as well. I now ask, how does sung Shakespeare compare with spoken Shakespeare? Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Opera has some resources not available in spoken drama that can provide greater dramatic tension and sometimes even deeper or different perspectives on the characters. Grand choral and ensemble scenes with full orchestra create an overwhelming depth of expression that is difficult to achieve through the spoken word alone. Consider, for example, the scene in Act I of Verdi's Macbeth, immediately after King Duncan has been murdered. Verdi brings the entire cast on stage for a great communal lament, but with the added irony that the murderers, Macbeth and his lady, participate in it. Most of these roles was the assumption that, 
because of their youth, boys could not master and memorize their parts if they were too long. In opera, castrados had dominated the high vocal ranges in earlier centuries. But in the late 18th and 19th centuries, women sopranos ascended for the first time to genuine star status. It was expected that the leading woman would be a soprano and that she would have a weighty role fully equal to that of the male members of the cast. A comparison of Shakespeare's and Verdi's treatment of Desdemona in Othello illustrates the shift in attitude. In Act I of the play, Desdemona only has two brief speeches of 10 and 12 lines each. And in Act II, scene one, she is limited to brief responses in conversation. And in the final scene of this act, after the disruption and fighting caused by Iago's machinations, when she and Othello are reunited, she has all of four words. What is the matter? To which Othello replies with nearly equal brevity, all's well now, sweeting, come away to bed. Come, Desdemona, tis the soldier's life to have their balmy slumbers waked with strife. Verdi, however, turns this brief moment between husband and wife into a grand and lengthy love duet in which Desdemona's role is greatly expanded and the two now have equal shares in the discourse. Here's the first section of this lengthy duet.
return now to the final scene of the opera, some two hours later. Duped by Iago into believing that his wife has been having an affair with Cassio, his lieutenant, Othello, in a jealous rage, has just killed his wife. However, from others he learns of Iago's treachery and that she was innocent. Devastated, Othello stabs himself and utters the immortal lines, I kiss thee ere I kill thee, no way but this, killing myself to die upon a kiss. The recurrence in the orchestra at this point of the kiss motif from Act One suggests that he is mentally reliving the ecstasy of their former happiness together, which makes the tragedy all the more heartrending, both for him and for us, the listeners. <laughs> Afraid of his production, he dies before he's able to deliver that final kiss. I have illustrated some virtues of Shakespearean opera, but significant features are sacrificed in the process of adaptation. First, there is the challenge of trimming the plays in order to make them suitable as opera libretti. The plays are characterized by great richness and variety, but there simply are too many characters, too many scenes, too many long speeches for an opera because sung text proceeds at a slower pace than spoken text. Composers have always found that the plot and dialogue must be condensed, and this means that minor characters, scenes, occasionally entire acts have to be sacrificed. Second, in the case of operas in foreign languages, many of the poetic qualities of Shakespeare's English are inevitably lost in translation. This is especially true for the witty repartee with numerous puns in comic scenes. Therefore, we are fortunate to have not one, but multiple Macbeths, Othellos, and Hamlets to enjoy, each for the virtues of its medium. That Shakespeare might have looked favorably on operatic transformations of his plays, I conclude with the opening line of Twelfth Night, spoken by Duke Orsino. If music be the food of love, play on. Thank you.
picked on Dr. Riggs earlier and said, you need to enunciate and keep your voice as a high baritone. <laughs> we were practicing yesterday. It's my pleasure now to introduce the man behind the camera lens who followed us through this adventure. He started out with me when I went to Prague the first time in September to hire the orchestra, find a theater, and generally make plans for Prague. And he stayed with us the whole time through the rehearsals here, um, recording so many of the, the experiences from students and faculty, and then went back to Prague with us to uh, film the end of that journey. Matthew is an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker for The Toughest Job, William Winter's Mississippi, which tells the story of Governor William Winter and his fight to pass the Education Reform Act of, 18, of 1982. He has produced, written, shot, scored, edited, and directed over 20 films, including Rebels, James Meredith and the Integration of Ole Miss, which chronicled the events leading up to the enrollment of James Meredith and the violence that broke out on campus in 1962. And the debate starts here, which documented the staggering amount of work done to prepare for the 2008 presidential debate at Ole Miss. Matthew holds an MA in Modern Languages from the University of Mississippi and serves as an adjunct professor of cinema production. It's my pleasure to welcome the podium the man who captured so many important moments as opera theater shared the story of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. opportunity to be here tonight. I'm so honored to have the chance to screen this film to you. I, I, I'll be brief, but I did want to thank the, uh, the Gertrude C. Ford Center for the Performing Arts for hosting this event. It's really exciting for me to, to be able to show and share this film with you tonight on the very stage that a year ago, uh, almost a year ago this month, uh, was, was the premiere of, of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Um, and uh, I, I've been several of the, the cast and crew are here tonight, so I'm really excited for you to get the chance to to relive some of the memories that, that, that uh, you shared with me. Um, I have, uh, for the past decade, I've had the great privilege of working at the Southern Documentary Project um, here at the University of Mississippi, um, housed under the, uh, the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, uh, whose mission has been to tell the stories of the South and to help train the next generation of filmmakers to tell their own story. Under the leadership of Andy Harper, I've had the great opportunity to tell a variety of stories. Um, stories of passion and triumph. Stories of, of adversity and great effort. Funny stories and scary stories. Um, uh, stories of, of uh, great joy and great sadness. And um, I am so proud of the work that we have done uh, at South Docs. And, uh, and Andy, I, I just want you to know how thankful I am for your friendship and, and for the support that you gave me on this project and, and every project. And I highly encourage all of you to visit our website, southdocs.org, to uh, learn more about the uh, department and, uh, and, and watch some of the films that we've produced. I think you'll enjoy what you see. Um, to my incredible wife, Melissa, who's here tonight, uh, thank you so much for your patience and your encouragement on this project for always putting up with my uh, discussions on editing problems and technical issues. Uh, you will always be the first person that I want to, to uh, share my films with, and I'm so thankful for you. Um, I, uh, <laughs> it was about a year and a half ago that Julia first approached us about um, do documenting this project that she was working on. And, and, I, and I gotta be honest, I was really, it didn't take me very long, like listening to her talk about this, to be excited about the prospects of this project. Um, I'm such a big fan of Hamlet, the story of Hamlet, and so when she said that that was the show that they were going to produce uh, for, the, for this opera, <coughs> I was—I just felt like it was meant to be. And um, I, 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 but honestly, more than that, um, more than the chance to to uh, sort of follow along this this production and the incredible opportunity to visit the Czech Republic twice. I, I, it, was, it was really exciting for me personally to be able to work on a project like this that was showcasing this passion, 
this collection of individuals that were working together on a shared goal to create something that was bigger than themselves. And the amount of talent and work and passion behind this, bringing together students with professionals, faculty members, staff, craftsmen, artists, all coming together to bring something to, to the table to create this, this project um, was really inspiring for me. And it was really, it was really exciting to see that and to see something that, you know, really the, the, not just the University of Mississippi, but the whole state of Mississippi could really be proud of. In a time where sometimes it's hard to, to find things to be proud of, I really feel, felt like that they accomplished that. And, uh, and they created something that was really worthwhile. And so it was a real honor for me personally to be able to document that. And so Julie, I really want to thank you for, for giving me the opportunity in a very small way to just be a part of that. Um, and so I hope that this film showcases just a, a little bit of that passion and that, that work um, to create something you know, that, that we can really be proud of. And, uh, and so I just want to thank you know, the, Julia and, uh, and, and all of you here tonight um, for continuing to create things you know, that, that are making the state of Mississippi better for all of us. So thank you so much for coming tonight, and I hope you enjoy the film, Singing Tonight Rest. There's nothing but black spots on paper till it's performed. There is no music till it's performed. So getting it performed is absolutely essential. Dr. Nancy Vandevate was nominated as the Alumni Hall of Fame here. And when she came, she told me she was working on a new opera based on Hamlet. So I said, bring a scene or two and we'll workshop it for you. We workshopped it, loved what she was doing. Then I asked if I would be allowed to do the premiere and she was thrilled to have her alma mater doing this world premiere for her of Hamlet and then take it to Prague, Czech Republic for the European premiere. Well, this production is amazing, not only because it's the coming together of, of all these forces from all over the world, but I think it's significant that the person who's bringing it to life is a woman director. Getting the materials together, deciding on the auditions, who you're going to cast. We started music rehearsals last semester, continue those through this semester, started staging rehearsals. You have people overseeing the design of the set and the costumes. And then now that our guest artists are in, they are being assimilated into the show. Previous to this, which has been another exciting opportunity, is that I've had students covering or understudying the major roles. So they've had the opportunity to learn this show and, and that experience and then work side by side with professionals. It's really been an enormous number of creative talents coming together to put this on the stage and offer it to the community here. The world of music is very small. How is it that 50 years after I was in Oxford, we come together in the Czech Republic <laughs> to record an opera that's going to be done again in Mississippi. It's very exciting and uh, a hallmark for this program. <laughs> to say Mississippi and opera in the same sentence, people would not respect that or just kind of smile, think, oh, really? You can do opera in Mississippi. And so part of that has been proving, yes, we can do opera here, and we can do it at a level that you can find anywhere. Please hold on. This train is departing. When we decided to do this European premiere in Prague, is actually going to Prague, and creating the, the situation makes it possible there. Nancy had used this Moravian Philharmonic and Peter Vronsky, who's the conductor, to do her studio recording. So they already knew the music he already knew the piece. Then you have to go and say, well, are they available in that time? And we kept looking for weeks trying to bounce that around. So it got them in place first and said, here's the time here, can you do it? Then you have to go to find the theater that I actually do it at that time when they're available. Orchestra pit, yeah. the backstage, everything about yeah. it is more conducive to what, what we need to happen backstage and on, on stage. So I think this is the one we want to mm. pursue and, 
and you just have to tell me, you know, at what point are we going to sign the contract and, and, and be, I'm ready to do that. So in New York or L.A. or even Chicago, people are used to the big opera houses there. But in Prague, as I tell people, I said, opera there is like SEC football here, if you want to put it in perspective. So it's very important to them. There is, of course, a certain pride uh, about the, 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 the institutions that we have uh, here on the continent people would very strongly relate to culture as an important part of their life. And that, of course, creates a very strong link between music, culture, and your audience. One, two, I've been working on the European project the whole time. So all along, the process has been getting ready for Europe, getting ready for Europe. There was a time for about a month that I had to drop all that and say, I have really got to focus on what we're doing here with the amount of money that was put into it and the amount of publicity we did. You know, there's a lot riding on that. And when you're in the Ford Center, the expectation is much bigger than anything we do. The Ford Center is as big as any commercial venue that these students will ever perform in. So the chance for them to get on this stage is a great asset for the university and, and will enrich their training here. This production is on a little different level than what we normally do, most because I have guest artists coming in to do the major roles. These are heavy roles, the expectation on them, the age of the character, that sort of thing. Two are faculty here, and then uh, a friend of mine that I've known through National Opera Association, Bill Bug, is coming to sing The Ghost and Gravedigger. I remember watching as well as listening to Richard Burton do several Shakespearean things, and he had he wanted to get that ring, that ring that was constant even when words weren't coming out of his. <laughs> you know, it was it was sort of a singing uh, approach to it. There is a lot of music in Shakespeare itself, I think. And then I was fortunate to be able to schedule Ryan McPherson, who's an up-and-coming tenor, singing all over the United States and Europe. Uh, to sing this major role. It's a huge role. Well, Hamlet is very difficult. It's uh, probably one of the longest roles that I've worked on. It's wonderful to be in a situation where you have a brand new opera. There's nothing to compare it to. This one is something where we, as a group, create something brand new, and that's very exciting. It represented a rare opportunity for the students to learn a new work by a living composer. And then it was even more interesting that that composer was able to come here. So they've had the chance to interact with her and perform for her. We only have one shot here in, in this beautiful theater and one in Prague. So it's one of those things that they, this may never be seen by them or have another chance to, to see something like this again.
exhilarating to know that, that it went so well and the students had learned so much and got to be a part of something unique. She was also doing the chemistry. Well, you see, this maybe brings, will bring people to contemporary Turper because it isn't that inaccessible. Right. You know, and it's, I mean, we have to have new operas every once in a while, don't we? Absolutely. Usually there's a little bit of a letdown after a big performance. You had to immediately go into, now I've got to get ready for Prague. It's never just about, oh, let's put on a show. It's always about, let's have a big experience for them. Let's take them abroad. Let's let them be our ambassadors.
crucial is to determine what we do the rest of the day. We've done a dress rehearsal and gone, oh. But I have the time to get people and rehearse it, run cues on it, make sure everything's where it's supposed to be. So we can tech, which will be weird teching after a dress rehearsal, but that may be the way it is. All right, don't drink the water tonight. Just drink wine and beer. <laughs> Brush your teeth with beer. <laughs> Uh, hope you've had fun. Everyone's feeling okay. They have had people in the hospital because of this water problem. So please let us know if you're having some difficulty. Brad's having some difficulty. All right, so we need to stay on top of that because obviously it can be severe. Unfortunately, Prague had a virus in the water. So by the time we found out about it and were notified and given bottles of water, people had already had drunk the water out of the tap and uh, this virus hit, and it hit with a vengeance. <laughs> you know, when I took a shower today, I was in the like, <laughs> like, oh, like, yeah, me too. <laughs> Like, don't okay, my mouth. You already brushed your teeth this morning. Yeah, you didn't shoulda told me. Did you? You're done for. I went, it was You're like two in the me. morning, and I and I went to the bathroom and I brushed my teeth while I was in there because my because my teeth felt bad. <laughs> and he didn't he didn't he didn't tell me. You just I heard the water run and didn't say nothing. Because when I went back to bed, I saw I looked at my phone and I saw the vibrator thing that said don't drink the water, and I was like, Jess, why are you telling me this? <laughs> <laughs> don't Here, drink the I, water. I got you, I got you. I, They had a rehearsal hall in Olomouc that was much easier for us to transfer us to them with all their musicians and rehearse in their space where they're comfortable with their conductor. Because the conductor felt it was such a huge piece, he didn't feel like he would have enough time really to make this work, because it is a complex piece. It's long, it's very difficult, and he didn't feel confident that we had enough rehearsal. What I found there, and this was told to me, was that university productions there are not particularly high quality. And so the expectations on the orchestra and for the theater people were that it was gonna be not a good quality production and they didn't take us very seriously. But then we changed their minds very quickly. When the conductor went through the first hour of our rehearsal with the singers, he turned and said, "This, they're fantastic, my job is so easy. I think when he realized how well prepared we were, he didn't worry anymore. Congratulations, singers. I thought it went extremely well. Such wonderful, wonderful orchestra, and the conductor is so sensitive to what you're doing. It's just, it's just wonderful. It's uh, a great. It's like a new, a new production for us. You know, so it's very exciting. Hope you're excited. I hope you all stay well. And nobody else falls <laughs> subject to it. <laughs> Thank you for singing today, even if you didn't feel your best. We hope we get Justin back tomorrow. So the plan tomorrow is be in your seat, ready to go right at nine o'clock. We're gonna start with Act Five. If you get ill, let me know. 
Thank I really you. do need Thanks to know. We were in it at 7 a.m. We had to leave by 6. And in that first day, we got all costumes in, set, trying to get lights hung. Everything had to be done for a dress rehearsal at 3 o'clock <laughs> that same day. I mean, that's astonishing. This is going to be great. And it's sold out, so every seat's going to be packed. It's going to be exciting. If we have it. <laughs> if we have it. If we have it. Yes. Crossed <laughs> fingers for health of our singers. <laughs> um, he's feeling a little better. Though. Yeah. He's going to rest. Other people are sick. I know there's so many people sick. I don't know what's happening. I think it, like, it's not all the water. I think there might be a stomach bug going around, too. I don't know how, but... No. But hopefully... Everybody will be okay by tomorrow. It's just whatever time o'clock our performance is. <laughs> That's all that really matters. Everybody knows you're working towards this goal. That curtain's going up. We must collaborate. We have to make these decisions. Sometimes the answer's no. <laughs> to say no, <laughs> or let's think about what can we do, can we do? And we were making up things as we were going, trying to fix problems. So there's no time, but that's why you're here, is to provide experiences for students by which they learn and prepare them for what they're going out into. We want them to strive for what's beyond what they think they can do. Always pushing them to say, we can do this. You are gonna learn so much by getting to this level. It's really about dreaming. It's really about saying, having a vision that said, we're gonna go for it. We're going to make this great and we can do that.
music is do it yourself. Yeah. Don't you find that? You do everything. Mm -hmm. You're your own publisher, your own agent, your own recording company. So if you don't love it, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but if you love it, you don't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Thank you for providing us with this vehicle to, to be well, a performer mm -hmm, and okay. to come to Europe and have this extraordinary experience. Well, wonderful. I guess it's I hope wonderful. everybody's as happy as I am. Oh, we are. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. of trying to get this there and then you sit in the auditorium and think okay here it goes lights down and first chord and you go it's gonna be all right That's the most wonderful thing about this kind of production. You take it back home and, and you realize that you have become part of a different culture for a while. And, you know, and it opens your eyes. It opens your horizon uh, in, in, in many, many ways. Congratulations, you, dear. Excellent job. Thank, Thank you. So Thank well. you very much. Woo. Thank you. It really went well. Maybe we can do it again. Who knows? You know? I'm sure the students want to do it again. They've already said that. When are we going to do this again? So. That's, that's the best part.
It was a genuine thrill to watch my students, former and present, and my colleagues present the world premiere of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, in this amazing facility. It now seems almost unreal that it happened, or it seems like 10 years ago, and now with this film, it seems like yesterday. And his film brought back so many memories of our trip to Prague, especially. Some of them I can laugh about now. <laughs> like the swords that had their own journey. I'm not sure where they went, all the countries they visited before they returned home. Uh, the water, the, the celebrated water. <laughs> Contentious TV in Prague who had to be paid off to leave the theater so that we could actually do this production. Um, but all the wonderful moments too, the fabulous desserts and all the moments. Um, the Charles Bridge and all the exciting things we got to do. So not only did we produce an opera, we also shared in an experience abroad and got to meet another culture and uh, thrill them with our productions. Standing ovation to the curtain calls, so we knew we had done well. We were 50 intrepid fellow travelers. I hope you'll allow me to indulge myself to recognize some of the cast and staff and orchestra members and members of our fan club that are here this evening. So if you would bring up the house, please. I would like to show my appreciation to various individuals and groups. First of all, my colleagues, Amanda Johnson. Our John Vernon, our conductor. Bill Macias was our set designer. I believe he's over working on Midsummer Night's Dream, so he's not here. Ashley Moss, our costume designer, she may or may not come. She's also working on our next opera. Uh, Matthew Graves, our documentarian. Also, our faculty guest artists, uh, Brad Robinson, Jennifer Robinson, Bill Bunn, <laughs> And those who play the orchestra, I know Robert Ricks is here and I see Sue Gaston, but is, are there other orchestra? All right, great. Thank you, our orchestra. <laughs> and to move along, we better do this as groups, but please do stand when you take behind the scenes staff. They make sure it all happens when it's supposed to happen. Charlie Miles, Carmen Taylor, Mary Poole, Whitley O'Neill, Olivia Sanders, Ed Nielsen, and my two graduate assistants at the time, Shalene Sugar and Zane Lynn. Please stand. <laughs> and our fan club, they gave us moral support. Sometimes they pitched in and did things too. That's Kate Hooper, Robert Aubrey, Renee Pulliam, Cynthia Linton, Jenny Bug, Frank Poole. And I have to mention my best friend, Dr. Betty Farrell, who set aside her vacation to take care of lots of sick people. So thank you to our fan club. And most important to me, uh, the individuals for whom this project was created, our student cast. So several of them graduated, they're not here, but please stand and allow me to thank you, Cody, Zane, Richard, Justin, Chance, Kayshawn, Chuck, Tabitha, Melanie, Jocelyn, Shalene, Megan, Lacey, Abby, Anna, Nina, Anna, Anna, Hillary, and Yasmin. Thank you. I'm truly grateful for the trust and support from all of you that helped bring my vision to an extraordinary reality. As you enjoy the reception in the lobby, please visit the memorabilia table and share your stories of our amazing musical journey with Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Thank you so much for coming.